Kraken Pro is the powerful crypto platform for experienced traders who demand the best. With advanced charts, real-time market analytics, and lightning-fast trade execution, Kraken Pro empowers you to trade your way. Customize your setup and make every pixel count by rearranging and stacking trading modules in a way that makes sense to you. On Kraken Pro, you have the freedom to put your favorite market analytics and execution tools exactly where you need them. And whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, Kraken Pro has everything you need to navigate over 210 plus assets with confidence. Join the thousands of seasoned traders who trust Kraken Pro. Visit realvision.com slash Kraken Pro. Well, ETFs put a floor under crypto. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Nicole Atchison, author of the Substack newsletter, Crypto is Macro Now. Hi, Noelle. Maggie, so good to see you. How are you? Good, good. So good to see you, as always. And we have a ton to catch up with in both the world of macro and crypto, which, as we always say when you're on, and and you were so pressing about this, are really kind of intertwined more than they ever were before. But let's start out on the macro front. We saw stocks, U.S. stocks, rebound today, and Treasury yields dip a little as traders try to weigh. I think the Fed's next move is really hanging over everything, right? We had some mixed data this week. We get the PCE inflation reading on Friday. What's your outlook for monetary policy? One thing I've been trying to figure out, Maggie, is the Fed insists that its policy is restrictive. We've heard Jerome Powell say this many times, and many of the FMC members repeat that. And I'm trying to figure out what are they talking about? Why do they think it is restrictive? We have the stock market consistently breaking through all-time highs. We have financial conditions as loose as they were at the beginning of 2022, before the rate hikes even started, which is crazy. You have annualized growth in consumer credit ticking up. It is now higher than it was before the pandemic. Corporate loans perhaps are weak, but corporates are not exactly struggling in the bond market. Credit spreads are close to record lows. And what's that, what else? Oh, it's annualized, um, so not annualized, sorry, but non-financial corporate profits are doing pretty well. They've ticked down maybe a tiny bit, but they're still much higher than they were before the pandemic. So what exactly does the Fed mean that its policy is restrictive? I'm just not seeing that. Um, a better question relevant to what you are asking, actually, is why would it lower rates mm. in this scenario? One good answer to that would be because it said it would. But it could argue that its credibility would be even more damaged by lowering and then having to rise again should inflation take up. Another reason why it might lower rates is political pressure to help bring the debt burden down or whatever. But the Fed is obviously adamant that it is not political, and we can fervently hope that that is indeed true. So I don't see the Fed lowering interest rates, I, three cuts this year, maybe one, maybe two, but not three. And the question then is, Maggie, what's the stock market do when that becomes increasingly obvious? Yeah, well, that was my next question, because you're right. And and by the way, this is... um. This is a sentiment that was also expressed by Bob Elliott yesterday. I just talked to Andreas today, and he's talking about that as well. But you are all in the minority right now. Um, it is a contrarian view because we know the market's still pricing in three. Yes, like on the margin, some Fed officials, I think, are floating a balloon here or there that, well, maybe we're, you know, they always say they're yeah. data dependent. But there, there is a mismatch. And so I, that really important question, and, and it's one we're going to keep asking, is where is the market most mispriced, if that's the case? What's the, you know, what area is most vulnerable to having to react to that? So yes, what happens to stocks, maybe that's largely dependent on what happens to bond yields, right? Because that is what really kind of wreaked havoc last year. We know so many people got the bond call wrong. You know, I think there's some data that's been showing that people have been, there have been inflows into treasuries as people, you know, are on the expectation that those rates are going to go down again. So it's very tricky. Nicole, uh, Noel, rather, do you, do you think that um, it's a matter of, if we were going to see a bond reaction, do we have to think about, do yields just stay here? Or do you think there's a threat that they have to adjust higher if the Fed's not easing? 
I think we're going to see yields go higher, not just for monetary policy reasons, but also for global uncertainty reasons. Let's face it, things are kind of, you know, iffy out there and, the you know, uh, there's no sign that things are going to get better anytime soon. So, yes, we're going to, probably going to see higher yields. Of course, that largely depends on demand for the dollar as well, as well as what other central banks are doing. We're seeing a divergence now in central bank paths. And this is unusual. Normally, central banks are around the world tethered to the Fed's movement. But again, we had saw Switzerland cut, we're seeing Japan hike, Taiwan hike. It's just getting really, really confusing. And so yields tend to rise in times of great uncertainty. There's more at stake at the moment rather than just, is the Fed going to cut or not? There's a a lot of a lot going on around the world. Markets are more intertwined than they have ever been. I personally do think we're going to see higher yields. I think we're going to see Inflation remains stubborn for the rest of the year, and I think that is going to cause severe strains in the bond market for sure. In the stock market, Maggie, we've been saying this for some time. Those of us that are in the minority have been saying for some time the stock market has to correct roundabout here because all the crates are crowded, ev- crowded. Everyone says so, and it's betting on three rate cut hikes that we just don't think are going to happen. But when the market adjusted from the expectations of six rate cuts to three, stock market kept going up. Yeah. So- my confidence that we have a strong correction has weakened over the past few weeks. It would make sense, but markets don't make a lot of sense these days. Yeah, no, they don't. And it's been really hard because there are all these cross currents, right? So, you know, the traditional maybe one-on-one relationship it is really tough. And that's why everyone's grappling with this. And you're right, this the, the, if they're on different trajectories, that's going to further complicate it because then you do pull currency into it. So it's interesting against this backdrop, one of the questions we get all the time is, you know, how do I structure my portfolio around this, right? Like, where's the opportunity here? What do I need to be worried about, especially for those who are looking at preservation and are worried about some really nice gains that they're sitting on in some of these stocks, especially if you were overweight technology, let's face it. Um, and, you know, h- how do I best structure a diversified portfolio? Does that look like it used to? What are the role of bonds in a portfolio? And now increasingly, we're also looking about what about looking at what about crypto? You know, should that have a position? What am I doing for that? Is that is that a differentiation or is there still correlation? So it's gotten really complicated. I'm, I'm really curious to get your thoughts. Um, which I will in a second, but this um, this question came up with Roger and Larry McDonald when they just recently sat down, especially in the wake of the ETF launch. A lot of people are sitting with their financial advisors. Now it's available through an ETF. So that question about whether it has a place in my portfolio is really, really relevant. Uh, here's some thoughts that Larry shared with Roger. Let's have a listen and we'll talk on the other side. It's kind of like the old 60-40. I mean, you know, gold is like the bond and Bitcoin is like the growth equity, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, so so I mean, what's the negative on Bitcoin? Well, let's let's not you know let's not hide it. The the real fact is the negative. Is Bitcoin is volatile as all hell, you know. And I mean, and we've had four or five seventy percent drawdowns. So, you know, I've got a lot of clients and investors who have millions of dollars. They've got them invested with me. If I put them all the way in Bitcoin and they had a seventy percent drawdown, they'd want to blow their brains out or kill me or both. And so, you know, they just can't handle. When you're older, you can't handle that volatility. You can't handle that drawdown. So yeah, it's it's it is like nitroglycerin. Um, you know, gold, the largest drawdown it's ever had is kind of in the 20% range. And in most years, it's flat to up and it averages up about eight or 9% a year. So, you know, it's much more widely distributed, 5,000 year history, et cetera. So in, in a, from a stability point of view, gold is far superior to Bitcoin. But from a performance and growth point of view, you know, Bitcoin has two things. They, they both have one thing going for it. Okay. They, they both benefit from the fact that the world governments today, as we currently see them, are locked in a loop where they have to print money. And we'll, we can go into that when we talk macro in a few minutes. But um, And because of that, currencies are being debased. And that's why everything costs more expensive. And when I was a teenager, gas cost 25 cents a gallon. You know, now it's $5, right? So, and that, that trend's just gonna continue. In 10 years, it's gonna be $10 or $15, whatever. And that's because governments print money. So, so Bitcoin and gold both benefit from that trend That full interview is available on our website. If you are not a full member of RV or you want to upgrade, it is worth it for these kind of conversations. So head over to our website and you can follow directions on how to do that. Uh, Super interesting. And Ralph, by the way, just pointing out a new spot ETF, Bitcoin ETF hit the market today. So there's sort of increasing options, which we'll talk about. But Noel, 
do you think that the, so we heard Larry's opinion there. Do you think the success of the ETFs, because by all accounts, one of the most successful ETF launches ever, the inflows have grown more rapidly than I think anyone would have anticipated um, and, and sort of rivaling gold uh, already, um, you know, where it sits. And of course that's been on the market for years. So does the, does the success of the ETF change things? Do we now have some kind of floor under Bitcoin or should we still expect massive price swings to persist? Well, I love that question. Tons to unpack there. First of all, do we now have a floor under Bitcoin? We always have had. I think this is one thing that a lot of people tend to overlook about Bitcoin. There's always been a floor and the floors have been strong and successively higher through cycles. And that will continue. We'll continue to see successively higher and stronger floors as we go through. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we have a floor, which is relevant to what Lawrence was talking about. Um, I love the term, you know, the comparison nitroglycerin, very evocative, but I'm going to push back on that because nitroglycerin blows up. You've got nothing left. With Bitcoin cannot really go to zero. And the reason it cannot go to zero is that there will always be some residual demand somewhere in the world for some use Mm. of the network, and there's no one who can turn it off. And as long as there is some demand somewhere, it's not zero. But most important things, there is no one who can turn it off. Whereas if you put all of your money in NVIDIA, NVIDIA could go bankrupt, God forbid, but that's not out of the realm of possibility. A bond can totally default when they go to zero. When a stock or a bond goes to zero, it does not come back from that. So again, slightly different floor equation there. And as to the question, the role that ETFs play in the floor, they do play an important role in the sense that they broaden the diversity of demand. And it's the diversity of demand, as I mentioned before, that creates the floor. The ETS themselves, no, they don't. And I'm sure I'm going to upset a lot of people in the market when I say that. But what I mean is the ETFs are an on-ramp. I mean, I could say just an on-ramp, but they're a Massive on-ramp, so I don't want to diminish their importance, but they are an on-ramp. If people don't have an interest in holding Bitcoin, the ETFs aren't really going to help. The ETF issuers are playing a very big role in spreading the education, in getting Bitcoin understanding out to a more diverse demographic, if you will, and that contributes to the floor. But the ETFs, the ETFs themselves, they add liquidity, they bring in new players in the market, very positive force but they themselves are not going to be giving Bitcoin a floor. That comes from diversity of demand. That is a just phenomenal explanation for that. And I, and I love the way that you broke it down. And, and, and I think really importantly, you're talking about it as a network, because one thing that comes up all the time is we call them cryptocurrencies, but it's not the same thing as we are traditionally used to when we're talking about something, this is a a protocol, right? This is a network that people do all sorts of things with. Um, and I just had a great conversation with Kevin Kelly and Sergio. You you all, Daily Briefing viewers, saw Kevin. Sergio came in for our event and we had a conversation. I'm trying to see if I can get that posted somewhere for you all. I'm working on that. But it was a great explanation of the ecosystem. And that's a, a, a really a better way to think of it. So when we're talking about a floor. I think that's a a great explainer on that diversification of demand. It's like a different way of thinking about it. And it's so good. I'm going to imprint that on my brain. So, um, so we will potentially see more volatility. So do you think, uh, sorry, we we will still see some volatility. That's not going to go away necessarily. It seems like that's the sort of nature of this asset class right now, which let's remember is still very young and in its infancy. Um, do you feel like we are seeing more global demand for these ETFs? Yes, absolutely. And on the two things to pull on there, I'll start with the volatility thing. I am an outlier in that I don't think that the ETFs are necessarily going to bring down Bitcoin's volatility significantly because volatility in Bitcoin, it's a feature. It's not a bug. Trading on crypto markets tends to be more expensive than trading on traditional markets. So to bring the market makers and the high frequency traders in, the liquidity providers in, you need some sort of volatility for them to be able to make enough money trading the small margins to be able to cover their costs. 
costs. So without more volatility, that's one of the problems that we've had over the, during most of the winter. There was not enough volatility for there to be liquidity. Now that volatility is coming back, the market makers and the liquidity providers are coming back. The market is picking up again. More people are doing more things. And that actually adds to volatility. I think this is something that a lot of people are overlooking. And one more thing to say on the volatility that I think other also is overlooked, the ETFs can add to Bitcoin volatility because they don't trade 24-7, 365. Mm. And Maggie, just imagine a scenario where it's Friday evening, Bitcoin plummets for whatever reason, and the sell orders that would be building up to just launch on the open on Monday would send the volatility up to an entirely new level. Were, of course, they able to you know, trade over the weekend, we would still see movements, but perhaps not quite as sharp. So my theory is that the ETFs do potentially add volatility. Bitcoin is a very counterintuitive market in this yeah. respect. We're used to understanding that more liquidity brings volatility down. I would say yes in everything except uh, crypto assets. And then on the global demand question, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing now um, Hong Kong is getting closer to issuing crypto ETFs, crypto, sorry, Bitcoin spot ETFs, which would be absolutely massive for the region, not only because Hong Kong is a sort of conduit uh, between China and Western style markets. Obviously, there would probably be some restrictions, but the market, even just a tiny, even just a tiny percentage of Chinese investors being able to put crypto ETFs in their portfolios, that's a massive potential inflow. We're seeing Japan start to reconsider their rejection of the idea of spot ETS because they don't want to see all of the Asian funds heading over to Hong Kong. And we're going to start to see the spread around the world. The key markets realize that if I don't, like the USA, if we don't do something about it, the funds are going to go somewhere else, especially when, as we referred to earlier, Maggie, there are increasing use cases, not so much use cases, increasing narratives to justify holding Bitcoin in a portfolio as the sort of insurance asset, even as, as Lawrence was referring to. Yeah. And we've got a question on that, but I want to ask, since we're on this uh, adoption issue about an ETH ETF. So since we've seen now this track record building, I think there was a feeling that ETH would be soon to follow, but it seemed like the SEC maybe threw some cold water on that. People don't know if that's just last minute posturing. Does it seem inevitable that we will also get an Ethereum ETF or is that still an open question in your mind? It's inevitable we will get an Ethereum ETF. I, I personally have no doubt about that. I just don't think we're going to be getting it within the same time frame that most people would hope. This mm -hmm. SEC is very much against the idea. And this ACC may not have any grounds to reject them because in theory, what holds for the Bitcoin spot ETF holds for the ETH spot ETFs, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to just check the boxes and maybe it's going to come down to another lawsuit to get that through. The, e the SEC does have one thread to pull on here and that is staking. And a couple of the issuers have added the redistribution of staking returns to the ETF holders, and that could end up being designated a security in the mm. Coinbase suit that we saw today is actually going to go ahead. So on, on that, we could see some pushback. And another point, though, Maggie, about the staking, even if the SEC says, all right, but take the staking out, that makes the ETH spot ETF not a good product because mm. any holder would earn more by holding the ETH and staking it themselves than by putting their money in the ETH spot ETF if they can't get access to the staking. So it's not going to be a great product. And we even saw BlackRock say just last week, I think it was, that they're not seeing much demand for this anyway. So it doesn't mm. sound like it's going to be a kind of something that BlackRock is going to want to fight the SEC on energetically. I don't think this SEC will approve an ETH ETF unless it finds itself blocked into a corner. But this SEC is not necessarily going to be around forever. So yeah. things will change. We will get an ETH spot ETF, just not as soon as the market would like. I think we should get one. I think there's no reason to deny it, but I don't think, I think there will, the SEC will find reasons. And even if they were to go ahead, there wouldn't be nearly as much demand as we saw for the Bitcoin ones. Yeah, and it's so interesting. I mean, it just seems like there's so much momentum that at some point, so that Coinbase headline did catch a lot of people people's attention because we know a lot of people, um, and if they weren't, they're holding Coinbase because it was one of the outperformers of the recent rally, right? I checked up 
30% in the last month, 262% in the last six years. So even if you didn't get, uh, sorry, six months rather, even if you didn't get on that first wave, you know, when it started to get that momentum, a lot of people jumped in and are holding coin in their portfolios. Um, what did you make of that headline on that case? Is that a worry? It didn't seem like it hit the stock that much, but it did fall a little bit. Yeah, and crypto assets dropped sharply when the news came out as well. It seems to be like an overreaction, to be honest, Maggie, because it's not a surprise. I mean, nobody really expected the judge to throw out the SEC's suit. I mean, that would be very hostile. I mean, we could hope, right? We could hope. But um, so it wasn't much of a surprise. And there was some good news embedded in there. Judge Faila did tell the SEC that you cannot claim that Coinbase wallet is a securities broker. That's one good, you know, that's one um, blow. And I wouldn't say blow, that's one thing in favor of DeFi. It's going to help the DeFi ecosystem quite a lot. But no, it's not great news. I mean, the judge did sound somewhat sympathetic to the mm. SEC's arguments that some of the securities traded on Coinbase could be securities. But obviously, that's going to be decided when the case actually goes forward. But again, what's the worst case here? The worst case is that Coinbase loses and gets slapped with the Potentially significant fine, but Coinbase is doing very well at the moment, especially with the market pickup and with the ETFs. So it wouldn't necessarily impact or put in danger Coinbase's core business. Meanwhile, Coinbase continues to expand internationally as well as international markets are picking up in volumes. So bad news. I think the market seems to be overreacting. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I'm sure they're, they've got a, their legal fund is looking better these days with that kind of gain on their on their equity. Um, putting and it the away judge, for a rainy the day. judge did say the judge did say very nice things about Coinbase's legal team. So there's that. Well, there you go. Um, so Paul has a really interesting question. Do you think the availability of bit spot Bitcoin spot ETFs and their popularity undermines the adoption of Bitcoin as a currency and a store of value? Are the ETFs really good for Bitcoin? Yes, they are. One, because they bring choice to the market. And Bitcoin from day one has been about choice. If you want Bitcoin to be a currency, use it as a currency. Don't hold an ETF, but use it as a currency if you want it to be a currency. If you want it to be a store of value, you can hold it in the ETF. You can hold it in self-custody. You can do what you want with it. Bitcoin can be whatever you want it to be. If you want to hold the ETFs because you think Bitcoin is a new technology, that has as yet and yet tested use cases, you can do that too. Bitcoin is all about choice. And we can choose the convenience of centralized market infrastructure players if we want. That's mm -hmm. the age old choice between convenience and security. Or we can go totally self sovereign if we don't want to go through the centralized holdings. I get so frustrated, Paul, when people say that, oh, now Bitcoin is centralized because there are ETFs. No. You can use centralized services if you want to. You don't have to, though. It's about choice. Yeah. That's a, good, that's a great way to put it. So I wanted to flag something else. Um, and it was in your Substack today. It had a great uh, section on something called Project Guardian and the way Singapore is using blockchain to position itself geopolitically. I mean, this, I think, is, a, is such a great example of why crypto is macro now and why we spend time talking about it. On, on the daily briefing, as well as more in-depth in other parts of our platform, because this is increasingly has its tentacles everywhere. And it matters, even in a subject like geopolitics. I just thought this was so fascinating. Noelle, can you kind of just give us a broad overview of what's happening and why it's on your radar? Oh, Maggie, thank you so much for mentioning that. Thank you for reading the Substack as well. I really appreciate it. And thank you for pointing out that one of the aspects that I find most fascinating about the shifts that we're seeing. I know you find market infrastructure as fascinating as I do, but it gets even more interesting when you step back. I've been diving, because of the crypto's macro now narrative, I've been diving into a lot of the work that has been going on on tokenization, stable coins, central bank digital currencies, and there's so much experimentation going on at the moment. Even beyond experimentation, real life projects out there, real life investments being made is at a totally different level than it was a few years ago, just from the caliber of the participants. Legacy finance is here and crypto investors are all on board as well. 
Now, what is fascinating to me about some of the trends that I'm seeing, it's not so much the what is going on in experimentation, because there's just a lot of what going on, so many people doing so many different things. It's the why. And when it's it goes beyond, Maggie, it goes beyond market efficiency and access and transparency and new types of markets. It goes beyond that. It actually does impact the geopolitical stage. And Project Guardian is a great example of this. It's a consortium of big name global banks led by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And they're all testing a lot of things on public and on permissioned blockchains. We've got fund tokenization, we've got repo settlement, FX applications. There's, there's a lot going on. But again, it's not so much the what, it's the why. Why is Singapore uh, coordinating all of these efforts. And it gets interesting when you start to look through the lens of history at Singapore's role on the global stage as sort of the conduit between East and West. Singapore mm -hmm. is one of the world's leading FX centers, largely because it's a conduit between East and West. It's smack dab in between the trading time zones of Europe and the West Coast of the US. And a lot of global trade passes through Singapore's port. It's a tiny city state. It doesn't have a lot of natural economy. It imports, it refines, it exports agriculture, commodities, um, minerals, and uh, arguably you could uh, chemicals, you could say also finance, imports, mm -hmm. refines, exports. But Singapore is starting to look ahead at what's coming. It's looking at an uncertain world with shifting geopolitical alliances. It wants to remain vehemently neutral but it can only do that if it manages to want entrench its technological advantage over many of its regional competitors and uh, also just position itself as the most efficient trading port, in, in their quotes there, for global finance. It recently overtook Hong Kong as Asia's largest financial center. It's now the third largest financial center in the world. I think it is now trying to usurp London as the second largest. And it plans to do so, in my opinion, through investing in the technologies that it sees coming down the pipeline to make mm -hmm. cross-border transactions more efficient, more transparent, and more flexible. It's it's absolutely mind-boggling. And you're right. Talk about playing the long game and taking advantage of its position. And it's not just the why, it's also the who. So we just put your, your sub stack up. I, I encourage you all to go read about this because big names in finance are involved in this too. Um, and it gets, it, this is where it gets very interesting. Like these, the, you know, if you wonder about this sort of technology being around, um, this gives you an indication of what the sort of, you know, most forward looking minds are doing and how that is going to have a hand in this sort of reshaping geopolitical powers and spheres of influence, just amazing stuff. And I love your global view on this, always Noel. Um, we got a question from Christopher, and I want to squeeze this in though because it's along the lines of what we're talking about. Mark asking, um, Noel, I saw a heat map showing India as one of the highest adopters of crypto. Is the influence of India in crypto markets underestimated? Great question, Mark. India right now has uh, something that's damp one of the most significant dampeners on the Indo crypto market is the regulatory hostility. It's not quite as obvious as in the US, but they're not loving the crypto markets there. And so a lot of the exchanges, many had to shut down. Some are operating slightly offshore. There's clamp down on that. Um, India has the potential to be a massive crypto market should they ease up a bit on the regulatory hostility. Mm -hmm. Right now it's expensive. It's um, not, again, not very convenient. The market infrastructure is underdeveloped compared to other regions in Asia. Hopefully they will start to realize the opportunity they're missing out on soon because it could be a massive market. Yeah, and this is where it, it gets interesting because you're talking about market forces in some places outpacing. And so, to, you know, that however you feel about it domestically, you, you suddenly internationally, if you have a pace car, that's really garnering a lot. And this is where Singapore makes it very interesting. Okay. Switching gears, Christopher, who's not, not so interested in the crypto markets wants to know, um, what to expect from jobs data, Friday's inflation print. And do you think the fed is looking at the wrong data? Oh, yes, to the last, definitely the last. I had a feeling uh, we knew the answer to that. <laughs> oh, that, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that one. I was looking at um, the GDP versus GDI the other day. 
uh, GDI for those who who don't follow, who aren't like nerd bits like me, uh, gross domestic income, which measures profits, taxes, wages, basically income, all of the costs that go into making GDP. And in theory, they should be the same. Income should equals, you know, ingoings equals outgoings. That's just simple, basic economics. Only the discrepancy between the two now is its widest on record, and records go back to 1948, never been this wide. And GDI, annual growth, is negative. GDP, we are very used to following that, and that's been surprising to the upside. GDI, negative. And uh, this is relevant because the NBER does take, it doesn't just look at GDP, it looks at GDI as well. And that, the NBER, again, for those who, who don't follow the, the details like, like, like you and I love, Maggie, mm -hmm. um, that's the National Bureau of Economic Research. And it's the, it's the body responsible or entrusted with deciding when a recession begins and when a recession ends. So yes, I think the Fed is looking at the wrong data when they focus on that. Um, when it comes to inflation, we're, I think we're going to see continued stickiness. There's absolutely nothing to continue the, the, the trend that seems to have been stuck now for something like eight months. And on employment, this, it's, again, there's a bit of mirage, smoke and mirrors here. Mm -hmm. The employment data the last time around was not great. I mean, the headline figures are excellent, but uh, there's a decline in full-time jobs and an increase in part-time jobs. That's not that healthy. Also, Government jobs were 20% of the jobs growth in the last three. The last time that happened was in 2008. So again, there are signs that the job market is not quite as robust, but until we see a drastic move in the jobs market, consumption is going to continue, inflation is going to be sticky, and I think it's too soon to start to see that yet. We haven't seen any signs of it so far. When it starts to move, it'll move fast, but it hasn't really started to move yet. So watch, you've got to watch the unemployment number. That's the big headline number that everyone's going to be focusing on. I think it's right to focus on that because that's just a big number, let's face it. Um, and again, it's not moving yet. We could start to see it soon, though, because of the weakness that is there when you lift the hood a bit. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting if this inflation runs hot and the Fed suddenly changes its messaging because, boy, that slammed the market a few times last year. And if they if they sort of get off that forecast they have and the, and the, and people aren't expecting it, um, that could be a big day. I have a feeling our options friends would say, check out the options markets to see when yeah. that's shifting. <laughs> it, could also, it could also be just as disconcerting, Maggie, if we get bad inflation data, as in inflation is stickier, higher than mm -hmm. expected, and the Fed doesn't change its messaging. Yeah. That would be also kind of worrying. Yeah. And and do we ever see bond vigilantes again? Um, that's something we talked about with Bob yesterday. Seems a long way off, but um, fantastic stuff. I just want to remind everyone when we're talking about Singapore, because I'm slightly obsessed about that story. Um, don't forget, we have a Singapore event happening, Rouse Out for Super AI. And this is the other thing. Not only are they focused on blockchain, all the technologies, they're also running in the direction of AI um, for the same reasons I think you explained, Noelle, is that they are looking into the future and really establishing themselves as a tech and finance center. Um, but there is a, a big event happening out there. Ral's going to be there. We're having some events there. So, um, Bri, if you could stick in the in the chat or under the just in the in the comment section, maybe on our platform, we'll put where you can get information if you want to go and participate because there is a, a discount for Real Vision members. Um, and then the last thing. Noelle, thank you so much. Uh, it was so fantastic having you. And I know you probably saw this news today, as did many of you, um, and stopped and had a, a think about it. But um, you may have seen the news that renowned economist Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman rather, died today. He was one of the, for those of you who may not be familiar, he's one of the pioneers of behavioral economics and won the Nobel Prize in 2002. His genius was really recognizing that humans are far from rational, as if we don't know that, and have mental biases that can impact all corners of economics. There was a time when people didn't really understand that. It seems so obvious now. Um, he actually came on a festival of learning we had in 2021. You're seeing some footage of that and talked to jo Josh Wolf about decision making and investors having an edge. So, so interesting. We put that back on the platform so you can all go and watch it and soak up all of the knowledge. What an incredible contribution to society. He's going to be greatly missed. I have seen that. Note, that is sad. Yeah, I seen that. That it, is sad. it is. He lived to a, he lived to a ripe old age and, and left a lot. And his book is considered by many to just be um, one of the foundations. So in your free time, if you're a 
approaching the weekend, it would be probably be great to take a walk back and and view some of that. It's it's information that never gets stale and old. It's just amazing that that he had the foresight to understand that, along with some of his other fellow economists and psychologists, because he was actually a psychologist by training. But anyway, we leave you with that gift, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks for the great questions. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Take care and good luck out there. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Kraken Pro is the powerful crypto platform for experienced traders who demand the best. With advanced charts, real-time market analytics, and lightning-fast trade execution, Kraken Pro empowers you to trade your way. Customize your setup and make every pixel count by rearranging and stacking trading modules in a way that makes sense to you. On Kraken Pro, you have the freedom to put your favorite market analytics and execution tools exactly where you need them. And whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, Kraken Pro has everything you need to navigate over 210 plus assets with confidence. Join the thousands of seasoned traders who trust Kraken Pro. Visit realvision.com slash Kraken Pro. 